Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang, currently sheltering in place in San Francisco. U.S. stocks halting a two-day slide, rising today as investors digest the latest round of corporate results. Oil also rising from record lows. We are standing by for the Daily White House briefing. The president just tweeted he expects it to start at about 5.45 p.m. Eastern time. Meantime, New York reporting 15,000 deaths in the state so far, but the lowest number of daily deaths for some time. Governor Cuomo saying 474 people died in New York in the last 24 hours. Still, we've got cases surging in Italy, in Singapore, in Ireland. That said, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin saying he believes most of the U.S. economy will be reopened by August. I want to bring, bring in our markets reporter, Taylor Riggs, who's been watching the back and forth today. So, Taylor, what do you think is driving the rebound in particular today? Emily, sort of as you mentioned at the top, markets are breathing a sigh of relief. As you mentioned, we're waiting for that $484 billion stimulus package that's set to go in front of the House. You're getting some signs of the flattening of the health curve that we've been talking about, as well as earnings. We're all getting back to some of the fundamentals and oil rebounding after six straight days of losses. So markets sort of taking a little bit of a sigh of relief. Take a look there at the Sox. Your world within the chip makers, Emily, up almost 6%, having one of its best days, clearly the biggest outperformer. As I mentioned, a lot of earnings are underway, so really getting back to fundamentals of what's actually driving this market. Two companies in particular within that SOX index that I'd like to highlight, Texas Instruments, they're reporting better than expected quarterly results, and they did say that they would uh, build up future inventory to make sure that they are there to take advantage when demand comes back online as well as Intel. They're jumping after analysts over at Jefferies raised their price target on the growth of data center chips. This is all ahead of their company results tomorrow. So sort of a broad based rally across the board, sort of a general risk on sentiment, but sort of in earnings, you're getting that sense that we can get back to some of the fundamentals. It's really driving some of these tech stocks underneath the hood. Meantime, Taylor Lyft pulling its 2020 guidance. Uh, Uber had already done the same, but you've got some analysts out there saying Lyft might be in a better position than Uber, which is interesting given that Uber does also have Uber Eats. So you would think perhaps not necessarily as exposed to the drop in on-demand transportation. What's driving this theory that Lyft might be in a better position? Well, in all of that geographic diversification, as well as that business line diversification that Uber has, really made analysts come into this thinking that they could maybe weather the storm a little bit more better than Lyft. Interestingly enough, I heard from Rohit Kulkarni. He's an analyst over MKM Partners. He said that the silver lining in all of this is that Lyft didn't start to see some of the negative revenue trends start until March. Uber noted on their call on March 19th that they'd already started to see a lot of the negative revenue trends start to come as early as January, even February, given their exposure to Asia. So given that Lyft really operates exclusively in North America, this could be a blessing in disguise. This is according to Rohit Kulkari, uh, given that they could have a cleaner recovery story. Lyft really is only focused on the U.S. in North America, so they don't have to worry about a lot of the problems and the rising infections that you're seeing, as you'd mentioned, over in some of the um, uh, Asian countries and the reinfections, they could be poised here uh, um, to have a little bit of a, of a cleaner recovery story. Really a different take on some of the analysis that we heard really coming into this year about having that diversity and, and the really geographic diversity that could have been a uh, strength uh, to Uber before all of this happened. Interesting, uh, Taylor. Of course, Uber has also been pushing that story that their diversity uh, will ultimately help them uh, in the long run. Okay, Taylor Riggs, thanks so much for, for giving us the update there. I want to move on now to Founders Fund. This is a venture capital firm that's backed some of the biggest names in technology from Facebook to Airbnb to SpaceX and Palantir. Earlier today, I sat down with partner Keith Raboy, uh, who's well known for his contrarian views, and asked him for his thoughts on just how hard this pandemic is going to hit the economy, the tech economy, more broadly. Take a listen. I suspect this has a long-term impact, measured in closer to years than quarters. And I think it may not be deeper, but it's very long and pronounced. So there's definitely going to be more layoffs. There's a lot of layoffs and, you know, slow, slowly hiring to layoffs that are forthcoming that aren't yet public. But I think the impact will be very, very long, more like 2000 and 2003 than like 2008, which was really a three to five month blip. So you're seeing years, several years. Well, it depends on what parts of the system, but yes, I think the impact could be extremely long. So for example, 
post 9-11, if you just looked at the travel industry in the United States, uh, just before 9-11, we hit a peak in all time domestic travel. It took until May 2004 for travel to rebound back to its peak. So that was like almost three years. You're a noted contrarian, and we always love hearing your contrarian views. We've been speaking to investors who are saying, look, if you're going to lay off folks, do it all at once, cut deeper than you might think you need to cut so that it's not death by a thousand cuts. What's your advice to portfolio companies that might be contemplating this? Well, I don't think there's a one size fits all piece of advice for all portfolio companies. Companies have you know, different sizes, different balance sheets, and, and different impact, um, or there's differential impact. There's some companies that actually are growing. I think telemedicine companies, DoorDash, are actually growing in the new, in new world order, but most companies are affected and impacted in a negative way. So the general advice is either control your own destiny, which means get to break even or something close to break even, which is either lowering your costs, raising your revenue, or some combination thereof. Number two, have enough resources so that however long this takes, that you don't have to raise money under pressure for a very long period of time. Let's call that one to two years so that there's more visibility into what's going on in the ether. Right now, everybody's kind of driving blind because no one can predict when the healthcare crisis ends, let alone when the economic mess sort of, sort of fixes itself. What about big companies? There's some debate about whether the government should be barreling out airlines and other big companies. Should they? I think it var- the, the answer varies. I, I think where the company has made miscalculations and mis, um, mis- scenario and has failed to engage in scenario planning, I don't think the government should be bailing out anybody. But there are some industries where the government legally is banning you from engaging in business. Think uh, an SMB down the street in in San Francisco. The government by fiat is saying you shall not sell to customers. If the government is prohibiting you by law from engaging in your business, I don't think the business is at fault and the government should take some responsibility for the policy decision of banning the commerce. So, so then would that apply to airlines? Well, technically, you're allowed to travel right now. In most, most cities to most states, you're allowed to travel. So for the most part, no. I do think also the, the, the airlines kind of knew that things like viruses and pandemics were likely, if you read their S1 or a couple of S1 documents, they identify these as serious risks. I don't think the airlines really... Um, we're able to forecast would be a global pandemic all at the same time as opposed to route by route that you know travel from asia might be affected to the us which might be 40 percent of their business versus travel everywhere but I, I i i i think it does matter what the company could have reasonably planned for what the industry could have reasonably planned for versus what the government has all of a sudden out of nowhere dictated must be the case and in those cases much more sympathetic to creating, whether they're loans or bailouts, because there, there are different options here. I think loans are less offensive than you know pure bailouts. But uh, so there, I don't, again, I don't think there's one simple answer. So Airbnb, a founders fund company, Lyft, a founders fund company, both of these companies deeply affected by the halt in travel, the halt in transportation. Do you think, you know, what is your outlook for, for these companies? I mean, how bad does it get for them? I think there's going to be tremendous long-term effect on travel, especially international travel, because I think states are going to take the idea of their borders more seriously. The idea of basically, I've grown up in an era where one could pretty much travel almost anywhere in the globe just by fiat. Like I wake up in the morning and decide I want to go X, I can go X, and I want to go to Y, I can go to Y. Yes, there's a cost of getting a visa in some places, but it's more mechanical and you know, not a discretionary really grant other than maybe five, 10 countries in the world where you know, there's like a sort of a hostile political regime. That error is probably over where just because I decide I wanna go somewhere, I can immediately go there. There's going to be whether you know, papers or other process oriented checks or health oriented checks imposed as barriers and that's gonna produce friction. Domestic travel I think will rebound faster um, I think people, A, when this is lifted, are going to want to escape their house uh, to some extent, insofar as they're lucky enough and fortunate enough to have the economic resource to do so. They're going to want to 
see other places. And maybe it means they're more cost conscious and they drive instead of fly, but they're gonna to wanna to go to national parks. You know, They're gonna to want to see relatives insofar as that's possible again. Now, there's been speculation about the coronavirus being created in a lab and you've made some um, um, controversial statements on Twitter about this. And you believe, as I can tell from your tweets, that it was nearly 100% likely, quote unquote, that it was created in a lab. Um, the Pentagon has said the evidence is inconclusive. The World Health Organization says it came from animals. Is that still your position and why? Well, the, my, my specific position is there's no doubt that one way or the other, this came from the lab. Creative is not exactly the right word. I think what actually happened is there's experiments going on in this lab by negligence or maybe gross negligence or reckless disregard for life. Some of the experimental animals were sold into wet markets and that's again technically against government policy technically but government chinese government policy has historically allowed control group um, animals to be sold back into through that market um but, but one way the or the evidence? other it's gonna be oh, there's lots evidence? of evidence everywhere yeah the, there's a git there's a git github account that you can follow that i tweeted that has that marshals a fair amount of evidence the mayor of San Francisco put a cap on fees that restaurants can have um, to pay food delivery companies. You call that stupidity. We are seeing a trend now where companies are asking their landlords to reduce rent. Companies are asking Amazon Web Services to give them a break on their cloud services bill. Do you think that this is something that companies should grant um, or not? Because I think we're going to see a wave of this over the next few months. We're going to see a wave of renegotiations and there's nothing wrong with commercial renegotiations. Um, the market is going to move in real estate, like the supply and demand, the supply and demand, lots of supply and demand work. There's going to be less people that want office space either because the failure rate of SMBs increases, the demand for remote work increases and minimizes the need for real estate. So landlords are going to have to adjust and the landlord may very prudently decide that I would rather you pay me less per square foot, but extend the contract or fail, right? Like, or literally fail because then I have to sue you in bankruptcy and you know, see if there's any money left. So voluntary renegotiations, I saw Amazon said no on the AWS stuff, but voluntary renegotiations are always a good thing. There's only like, you know, um, do, would I rather you pay me 50 cents on the dollar versus fail? often I'd rather 50 cents or 50 cents times bankruptcy risk. Um, but government dictating prices is basically a terrible idea. Supply and demand always works. And if the government mandates price caps, you're gonna get less supply. So like, let's talk about a company that does food delivery, any company that does food delivery. The primary cost to them, and the biggest headache for them is actually getting the people who deliver the food. These people are, you know, need to make real money. And particularly now they should make even more money because they're you know, putting their health at risk to some extent and working when everybody else is sitting at home. So if the government cracks down on the price, these people are gonna make less money. It's, it's, it be, that you can't, there's, there's no, or you have to raise prices to the consumer directly, but if you raise prices to the consumer directly, it just means less supply, meaning less people can, uh, sorry, less demand. Less people can afford it. Let's say you've doubled the fee that DoorDash charged. Less people can afford that. Well, less people place orders, which means the restaurant gets less orders, which means they make less total dollars than they would have under, you know, before the mayor interfered. So anytime the government interferes with supply and demand, you're really causing fundamental like crisis to the market, like rent control, like it's the canonical example. Almost everybody with a brain believes rent control doesn't work. It's kind of an old policy from the 1940s to 70s that basically every U.S. city has realized is stupid. And so we're doing rent control, but for food, which makes it made no sense for rent control. It makes no sense for food. Kiefer Boy there, partner at Founders Fund. Coming up, we're going to talk to an online bank that's figured out a way to get stimulus checks to folks before you can get them in the mail from the government. We'll have the CEO of Chime with us next. Also, we're standing by for the daily White House briefing scheduled to start about a half hour from now. When that begins, we will take you to Washington. This is Bloomberg.
Tens of millions of people now unemployed and many millions more than that waiting for stimulus checks from the federal government. The online bank Chime has been running a pilot program to get checks to users quickly, more quickly than the government can mail them. Joining us now to discuss the CEO of Chime, Chris Britt, as well as Bloomberg's Shanali Basik. Uh, thanks to both of you so much for joining us. So, Chris, I just want to know so far, how's the program going and what are you learning in terms of trends from consumers opening new accounts at this point? Hey, Emily, thanks for having having me back on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, what we decided to do is, you know, Chime offers um, basic banking services for millions of Americans. We believe that your your bank account should be fast, it should be free, it should be easy, and we want to be helpful. So we saw that government was taking very aggressive action in terms of, you know, both the PPP program one and now the program two, but also the direct-to-consumer payments. And when we uh, received notification through the Federal Reserve's um, you know, payments to the ACH system that uh, our members would be receiving their payments on the 15th of the month. Uh, when we received that initial notification as early as the 10th of the month, so five days early, we released uh, we released those payments to our members. So the net effect of, is, of, of all of that is that we uh, provided early access to over $1.1 billion of stimulus payments before they actually arrived in the accounts. And so not surprisingly, we got a lot of a lot of love uh, from, from many members that were excited about it. We didn't do it uh, as a marketing campaign or to drive a bunch of signups. We did it because we are member obsessed and, and we want to and we want to be helpful. But but the net result has been that, you know, we're, we've seen not just a lot of good social media, but also uh, hundreds of thousands of signups just in the past week. Chris, uh, to follow up on part of Emily's question there, what kind of customers have been accessing this part of the stimulus? What what do they need and what else do they maybe need from the government? Well, the first payments came through, uh, you know, the, the government, again, was, was trying to be really aggressive in this initiative. So what they did is they found uh, whatever routing and account number that they had on file uh, from tax returns, uh, they essentially just pushed through payments for anyone that qualified. So uh, that's typically for people that you know, make under 75K if they have dependents. Uh, so, you know, we, we saw quite a few customers that were eligible for uh, to receive these payments. And so those are the first payments that came through. But we're now actually starting to see the actual physical paper checks are, are now starting to be received uh, with with the Donald signature on it uh, or, or name on it. And, uh, and so we're starting to see those deposit into our accounts as well uh, starting this week. So what's your big takeaway from these government programs? Obviously, we know that the government approved an additional you know, $500 billion stimulus package, another $300 billion for small businesses. We can expect that that money is going to evaporate pretty quickly, seeing as how fast uh, the initial money went. You know, where do you think these government programs are succeeding and where are they falling short? Well, like I said, I think there's no question uh, that the, the – you know, how aggressive the government is trying to do to, to get money to consumers, both through companies, through the, through the PPP program and direct, uh, should be applauded. I think what this has probably done is it, it, uh, it's brought to light just the, the fact that the notion of mailing paper checks to people is just so ridiculous in 2020. And so, so I think you'll probably see a continued push towards trying to facilitate all payments electronically. So we're encouraging our members or, or new Chime members to sign up for accounts, go to the IRS website. If you haven't received a payment yet and you believe you're due for one, you know, plug in your routing and account number to Chime um, or whatever, wherever you do your banking. And that's the best way to get your payment. You don't want to wait another 15 or 20 weeks potentially to get a paper check. And, and unfortunately for a lot of people, it, 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 it may take many, many more weeks before they actually uh, uh, receive paper. So we're doing a lot to just promote that. We've got a ton of campaigns going to get people excited. We're giving away a million dollars this month as part of a Chime in for each other uh, program. So if someone, if a Chime member tweets acknowledging the awesome work right. that people on the front line are doing, uh, we enter them into a sweepstakes and we'll be giving away a million bucks this month Chris, in addition to you know, all the other things we're doing to speed things up. We've seen some interesting moves by some of the big banks, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, pausing overdraft fees. You've built your business on the premise of doing a lot of things existing banks don't do. What has this entire crisis told you about the banking system that's not getting to consumers? What should be different? 
well, the banking system is so heavily reliant on fees. And look, everybody's trying to do their best in this difficult time. But, you know, I even read that in all the, the PPP program, uh, banks, uh, it came out on NPR today that they've earned something like $10 billion in, in processing fees uh, to give out loans with, with what is essentially, you know, no risk. Uh, but the same on the consumer side. I mean, we, we are founded, one of our core values is around being human, and that means always having your back and, and designing products that are aligned with your best interest. And when you hear banks are going to waive overdraft fees, the question you ask is, well, why do you charge overdraft fees in the first place? You should, um, you know, we allow our members, we have a service called SpotMe that allows you to take the account negative for up to $100, and we don't charge you a fee. We just pay ourselves back the next time, you're, you know, your next paycheck comes into the account. So we think there's ways to design services and financial services and banking that can be way more aligned with consumers' interest, and we aim to set an example in that area. All right, Chime CEO Chris Britt. Chris, thanks so much for joining us, as well as Bloomberg Shanali Basik. Appreciate it. We'll be following to see uh, how that delivery of those $1,200 checks does go. Uh, coming up, we'll have more of Bloomberg Technology. We'll be right back after this quick break. This is Bloomberg. We are standing by now for the daily White House briefing. As soon as that begins, we'll take you there. Scheduled to begin now in about 15 minutes. We'll be looking for any clues, any hints on further progress on plans to reopen the economy. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has said he believes the economy will be almost fully reopened by August. Meantime, there's been some back and forth between House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Leader McConnell. Uh, Pelosi saying that she believes the next round of stimulus should be going to state and local governments. Leader McConnell saying those governments should be forced into bankruptcy instead. Uh, we'll be following any back and forth there. Um, also coming up, we're going to be talking about FanDuel. The first virtual NFL draft begins tomorrow. But will it come off without a hitch or a hack? We'll tell you about that next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. The first NFL draft will happen virtually starting tomorrow and go on for the next three days. How will it change drafts in the future, sports betting in the future? Everybody asking those questions. Will it come off without a hitch? Joining me now, FanDuel CEO Matt King. Matt, I know you've been now preparing for this for a few weeks. You've added some new activities to make this exciting for fans. Talk to us about just how much activity you're expecting tomorrow and, and what you're looking out for. So um, the draft is going to be a huge event this year, particularly it's always a big event, but obviously this year it'll be even bigger given the fact that uh, there's so little other sport on. And what we're looking for is a 10 X increase in our sports betting handle. And we'll probably see more than a 10 X increase in the number of people either playing one of our fantasy games or betting on the draft, just given the interest in it this year. That said, because it's online, that means it might be more vulnerable to cybersecurity threats. How concerned are you that hackers could try to derail this any number of ways? Hackers try to derail businesses every day, so it's just something that you need to get used to. Um, and so we look at it from the perspective of we know the NFL is doing everything they can to create a, a safe event that has full integrity. Um, and it's something that we're very used to in terms of managing potential cybersecurity issues. Um, but, you know, the draft, it'll be a big headline event. But the reality is people are trying to do bad stuff every day and you just have to defend against it every day. So speaking of this could have an impact on how drafts happen, of course, all year and perhaps how, how drafts are performed over the longer term. How are you thinking about that? What um, you know, in terms of you know, how this goes over the next three days could last beyond the next three days. 
So I think, I mean, the reality is everybody in the sports world is trying to plan for every eventuality these days. Um, you are testing the limits of what people are willing to do virtually. Um, and so I think you will see um, probably over time a better and better ability for people to produce entertaining events virtually. Um, I think the you'll see some, I'm sure, growing pains of the first virtual draft. Um, but I think over time they'll, they'll get better and better. Um, but the reality is a lot of it's just the excitement of the draft itself and whether people are in person for that happening or people are doing it virtually, I think the excitement's going to be the same. Meantime, you recently said revenue from March 16th through April 12th was down just 8% year over year. Some might have expected those numbers to be worse. What was making up for the shortfall? Was it casinos? So we have a really broad product set. So we both have casino products as well as we have, we operate the largest online horse racing business in the country. And both of those areas have seen incredible engagement um, really through just a larger and larger number of people playing those products um, as they seek out new forms of entertainment and also frankly um, take things that they typically do offline and try them for the first time online. So in 10 years, will FanDuel be making more money off of traditional sports betting or casinos? I mean, how should we expect the revenue stream to evolve? I think you'll always see sports betting to be the biggest market out there. It's something where it has the broadest appeal and just it, most likely it'll be available in more states than online casino. In the states that have both online casino and sports betting, they tend to be about the same size market. So uh, then talk to us a little bit about how you believe this shutdown will impact M&A more broadly across the gambling world. You know, obviously, we don't know what the new normal is going to be when some sense of normalcy returns, but we have to imagine that this will change business and perhaps even the sporting world dramatically. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I mean, I think we're just starting to see the effects of that. Um, I think in terms of the M&A landscape, you will clearly see a world where uh, the strongest um, balance sheets are probably able to use this as an opportunity to acquire um, you know, attractive assets. I think in terms of the gaming space in general, I think you will see a recognition of how important online is, both in sports betting and casino, to the long-term growth of the category. Um, and that's going to be something that I think both the casino operators take note of, but also state regulators. Um, the reality is gaming is, is a huge tax driver in a lot of states. And in a world where you know, physical casinos you know, aren't able to operate back at full capacity for a sustained period, I think you're both going to see consumer demand for uh, online gaming expand, but you're also going to see legislative interest in authorizing and expand because um, it's the right way to rebuild the tax base. So that was my next question is, do you think the budgeting pressure is going to lead more states to legalize sports betting? We think so. I mean, if you look at the core thesis of why so many states are legalizing sports betting is the reality is it's a recognition that this is an activity that's being done illegally today in an unregulated way, in an untaxed way. And so this is one of the few places where states can generate material revenue um, in a way that actually improves consumer protection um, and also is something that's seen as kind of bringing something that people want to do um, and making it more readily available and more and available legally. And then when you look at online gaming, um, kind of many of the same fact pattern is true, which is you have a lot of people that really enjoy casino games. Um, and in a world where you're sheltering in place, they're going to look for ways to get that entertainment at home, um, which online gaming does. And so we think that you're going to see a lot of states look at this because it's one of the easiest places to go for material taxes in a way that actually consumers like and are, are, are in, very interested in. Now, some people say that they believe election betting could be bigger than the Super Bowl. Just two weeks ago, you started taking election bets in West Virginia, but then pulled them down about an hour later. What actually happened there? And how big an opportunity do you think this could be? 
So I, I think let's start with what happened there. Um, obviously, you, sports betting, online gaming, they're all new categories and they're things that are um, new to a lot of states. And as with any emerging category, um, you have people like ourselves and frankly, like the regulators that are looking to always be innovative. Um, and this was a case where we had you know, a regulator in an environment where we were trying to do something creative that hadn't been done. Um, and the reality is that it was um, a big enough um, opportunity that, you know, we, that collectively it was approved too quickly. And so the decision was made to um, take a little bit longer to consider you know, what was the right way to do this. Um, and so it's something that is, you know, we think a long-term opportunity, but the reality is you, know, you need to walk before you run. Um, and so what we're focused on is just making sure you get the core sports betting market up and running um, in a really uh, attractive and safe way. And then we'll look to expand the offering over time. What we know globally is that it is election betting is a big opportunity. I don't know if it's going to be really bigger than the Super Bowl per se. Um, but I do think it's one which it's time will come, but I think it's time will be you know, further in the future. Meantime, I do want to ask you about some pending litigation. You're being sued by the families of some fantasy players who claim that you have been favoring professional players and, and deceptively marketing to inexperienced players. Obviously, you've been fighting, this, uh, fighting back on this. What is your response to some of these allegations? So I, I think as you look at our products, you know, we're very open about um, the way our products work. We're very open about um, kind of how different prize pools pay, pay out. And frankly, we're very focused on encouraging new players um, to play games where they have the highest likelihood of winning. And so if you actually look at the underlying data, the claims made by some of these, you know, in some of these lawsuits, you know, are baseless. And so for the cases that, you know, have gone through the full kind of court process, you know, by and large, we've prevailed because the facts have prevailed. And so this is something that, you know, it's an unfortunate reality of really any digital business these days is that you're going to look for, people will always look for ways to make a quick buck, even when the facts don't support anything. So as you look out through the rest of the year, what are you planning on in terms of sports resuming or not resuming and how this pandemic will fundamentally change the way you do business? It's a great question. Obviously, it's one that changes as the facts on the ground change, so to speak. Um, you know, we're, I think, like the sports teams themselves, planning for a number of different scenarios, everything from you know, some sports returning in a limited fashion in the next you know, 30 to 60 days to longer term outcomes um, that may um, have sports you know, not being conducted or being conducted in a limited fashion for a, long, a longer period. You know, we do think sports comes back. We think sports will be one of the first things back. And that's just because when you look at sports, it's, it's important to the overall cultural fabric of the country. And I think people in times like this are going to look for things to unify us um, and things that bring back um, some of the kind of core foundations of you know, the, the life that they've come to expect. Um, and we think sports plays a key role in that. So you know, we will look to be in the period where sports are not available, we're going to look to be an entertaining, fun place for our users and, you know, frankly, be welcoming to people that are looking for a distraction. Um, and then when sports are back, you know, as we always are, we want to be part of that kind of that moment in time and something that helps amplify that and make it an even better experience for sports fans everywhere. All right, Matt King, CEO of FanDuel Group. Matt, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts with us, and good luck as the draft kicks off tomorrow. Um, coming up, we're going to be talking about Netflix, a blockbuster quarter adding 15 million new subscribers. But is this as good as it gets? We'll dig in. This is Bloomberg.
Netflix adding a record number of subscribers, 15.8 million. But is that the best it's going to get for this year at least? I want to bring in Tuna Amobi of CFRA. Tuna, do you think that's the best it's going to get for the next few quarters? Um, you know, 16 million, I, I think it's uh, mind-blowing. And, um, you know, it's really hard to, you know, see that momentum continuing, um, you know, especially – uh, given the fact that, um, you know, I think they've given guidance for $7.5 million for the second quarter, which I think looks conservative. Going into these earnings, we knew that they were going to have a huge positive surprise uh, to the guidance that they gave, uh, not the least because of the benefit from the uh, in-home confinement. Uh, this is something that we're seeing um, across a lot of, uh, um, you know, streaming platforms. Uh, so the secular trends, Emily, are still there. Uh, intact. The question is, how much of this 16 million is actually potential pull forward uh, of subscribers? Um, I would argue that there's a, a very good chance that they're going to retain uh, a significant amount of subscribers who are getting hooked. A lot of shows that are just hitting right now, uh, capturing the zeitgeist. Uh, so all in all, I think um, the trends are still you know, favorable. The main question is, how much of that is already priced in? Uh, but we're keeping up by recommendation at $500 12-month target price. That said, Netflix doesn't have anything in production right now, as you know most folks don't, given the shutdowns across the country. How do you see Netflix in position versus Disney with Disney Plus, Apple with Apple TV, and 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 Amazon and some of the other smaller streaming players? Right. So I think Netflix just happens to, uh, you know, be uh, <clears throat> somewhat, uh, I, I don't want to use the word lucky, but I think they've actually, their business model has allowed them to plan their, you know, production way out. Uh, so as we sit here today, most of their, um, you know, they're pretty set with their content slate for 2020, because as you know, they have to launch all their shows just around, you know, simultaneously. 2021, they're pretty deep uh, in post-production. So as I kind of think about the uh, shutdown of Hollywood production, uh, much as they will be affected uh, the longer this outbreak continues. But I think, relatively speaking to the, the other streamers that you mentioned, I think they're in pretty good shape, except perhaps for Disney. Um, you know, they have been skewing a lot of their investments toward original content. You know, they said that they're going to license more if necessary, uh, just to fill out that pipeline. But I don't think they have anything to worry about for this year and potentially. Uh, you know, through the uh, early part of next year as well, if this outbreak, if this pandemic continues. So which of the streamers do have something to worry about? We were speaking with John Klein, the former president of CNN yesterday, who believed that this pandemic will just accelerate a shift that was going to happen eventually in that you can't have so many um, streaming players trying to play in the original content market. Um, this will separate uh, the good from the less good. And some of those folks will just have to settle on being distributors. There's no question that the streaming landscape is still fairly fragmented. Uh, remains to be seen how much um, this uh, pandemic will, might accelerate that consolidation. Uh, what we see at this point is that the data that we're getting from some of the audience measurement firms, you know, Nielsen and so on, are pointing to a spike in uh, in in-home in streaming. Uh, essentially based on his in-home confinement. So to the extent that, um, you know, this uh, pandemic continues, um, as ironic as it may sound, I think the streaming platforms across the board actually benefiting. Now, not so much for Apple, of course. We, it just uh, has a pretty very light, um, you know, content slate. Uh, but, you know, guys like Netflix and Disney, I think they're sitting really pretty. And uh, when you think about, you know, the likes of, um, you know, uh, uh, Peacock that just launched um, a few days ago, and also HBO Max just still about to launch next month. I think all these guys are looking at the, at the current situation and figuring that they actually, um, as bad as it sounds, they have actually a very good, um, you know, uh, opportunity to, um, you know, launch into captive, you know, homes. That being said, um, you know, there's no question that as we think about the second half of next year, um, it could be a, a rollback, um, you know, impact. But for now, I think um, it, it's just been uh, – a very good time to uh, have your content and, and have people discover and search and hope that a lot of these consumers will stay on once, once things normalize. Do you 
believe there, there, there's going to come a time when there will just feel like there's no new content? Uh, there will be, I'm sorry, Emily, what content? Do you believe there will be a time, maybe it's September, where viewers feel like there's no new content? Got it. Um, you know, I think where uh, September might be a little too soon for that, to be honest with you. As we kind of get toward the, um, you know, the uh, end of the year, we might start to worry a little bit about that. Uh, but the impact of that will vary uh, tremendously. I think some of the uh, newer upstarts uh, or those streamers that have relatively, uh, you know, light pipeline have much more to worry about uh, than the likes of, you know, Disney or, uh, or, or Netflix, for that matter. Um, or even, uh, you know, companies like, uh, you know, uh, Warner Media that might be forced to dig deeper into their library. Uh, so this really favors those uh, uh, companies that have a huge uh, library shows of content. And uh, the ones that will feel the impact the most, uh, of course, some of the, um, you know, uh, those that depend on maybe live, um, you know, kind of uh, sports offerings and things of that nature. But all in all, um, I think that most consumers are now willing to subscribe to more than one or a couple, um, you know, streaming platforms and complementing that in many cases where they are pay TV uh, subscriptions, which, remember, is still uh, in a decline, uh, and that decline might, in fact, accelerate. All right, Tuna Amobi of CFRA, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Coming up, we're going to be talking about Facebook making its biggest deal since it bought WhatsApp. We'll tell you how. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Facebook is making its biggest deal since WhatsApp, investing $5.7 billion in a major Indian telecom. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner, who covers Facebook. Kurt, it's not a straightforward deal. So explain to us what Facebook is actually buying here and what that means about their ambitions. Well, usually what we see from Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is him uh, spending a lot of money to acquire a company, uh, which you know we've seen him do with Instagram and, of course, WhatsApp for $19 billion years ago. What's unique about this is that he's not acquiring anybody. He is, as you mentioned, just taking a very sizable stake in a company. And, and why I think that's unique is that Mark Zuckerberg is usually someone who's in control of everything. So here's a relationship that he's not necessarily going to be able to control. But from what we heard yesterday from the two sides is that they see this as a strategic partnership because WhatsApp is huge in India and Geo has uh, a lot of reach to Indian small businesses and consumers. And so you can imagine a world in which WhatsApp is able to extend its reach uh, through this Geo partnership. And Geo, meanwhile, gets a, a nice investment from Facebook and also the existing now uh, relationship with the world's largest social network. So explain the telecom part of this and how that might also give Facebook some sort of advantage. Well, on the surface, it seemed obvious to me, right, which is that if you are providing uh, telecom services to people, you could probably uh, provide Facebook, uh, you know, maybe for uh, pre-install on a phone or you could uh, offer it. Uh, what's called zero rating, so you could maybe uh, take away the data uh, that you would usually have to use to use Facebook and basically offer it for free. But what I'm told is that neither of those things are actually happening. They're not trying to create what they would call special access to Facebook through this partnership, which does make it a little bit more confusing to me. And what I think is that they actually haven't uh, quite established what this is going to look like. I think the biggest thing is that Geo also owns uh, an e-commerce division it's called GeoMart, and Facebook is trying to get in, uh, you know, with small businesses in India. And so there's a lot that they can probably learn from Geo, and there's a lot of existing relationships Geo has with businesses in India that I'm sure Facebook is hoping they can transport over to their platforms. All right, interesting. Well, certainly it's a story we'll continue to follow. You'll continue to follow Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner 
for us. Thank you. Uh, we're still waiting for that White House briefing to begin. When it starts, we'll take you there. You can also tune in to Live Go. It should begin any moment now. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Daybreak Australia is next. This is Bloomberg.